Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Marty. I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hi, I'm an active member of the uh, Richmond Lions Group in Richmond, British Columbia, which is a suburb of Vancouver. And I, my sponsor's name is Dick. If you don't know Dick, you don't know Dick. And um, <laughs> yeah. it goes over better in, in North America than it does in Europe, I'll tell you that much. Um, <laughs> I would sincerely like to thank the committee for having me here. I needed this conference. Um, it, 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 you never, you never come to one of these in this place that it is not just outstanding. It's just an outstanding convention. There's so much energy here. And, uh, <laughs> And I was, I was, first of all, flattered to be invited and then almost martyred. Um, Jim picked me up at the airport at 5 o'clock. At 5.15, you had the worst hailstorm in the history, probably since the Earth's crust cooled. And, um, <laughs> the gate went down on the airport parking thing and the first baseball hit the car, uh, which, you know, if you're me, that's not uncommon. But then, it was, honest to God, it was like uh, a thousand Major League Baseball players hucking balls at the cars as hard as they could. And I knew they weren't from the Blue Jays because they were hitting the car, you know? <laughs> uh, that's just wrong, isn't it? That was wrong. <laughs> I looked across at my my co-pilot, uh, a man obviously four months younger than me, a newcomer. Um, I threw my body over his. Um, <laughs> he said he was already in a relationship. Um, It wasn't until he started crying and looking for his picture of Dick and Peggy that I realized we are really in trouble here. And, uh, I walked up to Dick and said, Hailstones, he said, Hail to the chief. So I'm, I'm going to try and talk a little slower tonight after uh, what Larsine did to these people trying to do uh, a job. She, she talks at 300 words a minute with gusts to about 450. And, um, oh my God, what a woman. She reminded me of, I, I've said this many times, but I, do, you, do you think that that, uh, that voice in the GPS in your car, do you think that's an Eleanor? <laughs> you know what I mean? Turn left. Turn right. <laughs> and it sounds like they know where they're going, but not always. Now turn left. And they never get pissed. I mean, they just get calmer. You are off course. <laughs> and then, and then when it, they really melt down, they say, "Recalculating." <laughs> yep. What a trip this conference has been so far. We've been in the cockpit of a, a fighter jet. We've been held at a thirty-eight gunpoint. Um, the most terrifying story I've ever heard told at a podium of Alcoholics Anonymous, sobering up in a Chuck E. Cheese. Jeez. <laughs> I suddenly thought, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> the 
loved every single speaker. It's been absolutely, well, like I said, it's just, it's the energy of the conference. You have conferences that just have a life and they take on meaning. And this one is layer upon layer, precept upon precept of learning. It's been, it's been just excellent. I just want to say a quick word to the newcomers. If you're new in the room, how many new people say in your first 30 days here in Alcoholics Anonymous in the room? Welcome. Welcome. Look, it, it's really hard. You know, you get here and there's some windbag from Canada. <laughs> Who cares? Um, up there talking about how happy he is. And uh, so I'm going to tell you something that you need. You can put this in your backpack. If you don't hear one other thing I say tonight, take this with you. And uh, because it's going to happen to you, I promise you, somewhere along the line, in your early sobriety, somebody's going to ask you to drink. Here is a drink. And you need to have something to say, so I want to tell you what that is. You just look them in the eye, okay, and this is, keep your voice calm. And just say, look, I have a biochemical genetic disorder centered in the hypothalamic information control center of my brain. <laughs> which is made worse by my liver's inability to metabolize alcohol without producing acid aldehyde, which mixed with dopamine produces tetrahydroisoquinone. <laughs> and if they're still not getting it, go on. Just say, which is a nasty combination given my narcissistic core, <laughs> which is driven at times by feelings of omnipotence, which tend to their own integrity despite the cognitive dissonance and stimulus augmentation. If, if they still want you to drink after that, they don't care about you. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> I know. They say you shouldn't sponsor anybody until you're a couple of years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I didn't know that. At six months sober, I sponsored a young guy. 18-year-old who's still sober today. He'll be 34 and a half years sober at this point. <laughs> I forgot to tell you that, didn't I? My, I had my last drink of alcohol on February the 8th, 1976. <laughs> and, and when people used to ask him if, he would, if he'd take a drink, he used to say to them, I'm willing to take a drink if you're willing to sign a document that says, when I wreck your house, your car... Make a pass at your wife and probably abduct your dog. I do not want you to press charges. Are you willing to sign that? Because if you are, I'm willing to have a drink. <laughs> I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, and these people in these pictures look so old. And uh, every year they don't look so old. I was just thinking, <laughs> Jesus, Bill's starting to look like me. But... Uh, <laughs> It's unbelievable how 35 years got away. I mean, I just came here to kind of get the heat off. I had no earthly idea it was going to screw up my drinking for this long. <laughs> See, Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship. And, and, you know, one of the things they tell us is that you remember if you say you remember. That's true. But if you're going to become in this fellowship, it's a very different sort of a thing. You're going to start immediately to start reaching out to other people, which was what my experience was. When I got here, and I want to tell you that I'm not one of those people that thought that alcohol was necessarily the only problem. Although you would think that. Even our name seems to indicate that, you know, we're Alcoholics Anonymous. It's alcohol, right? And the reason we're anonymous, of course, is because when you're new, we're all over the place and you don't know who we are, and we are watching you. That's why. <laughs> it's, it's not, that's not true. My, my first sponsor told me that. Um... It was years before I found out his real name, uh, Shrek. And uh, <laughs> when the movie came out, I thought, that bugger, that's been, it's, it, it's him, it's Shrek. And uh, so here, here's what I, I know about my alcoholism at this point, and uh, I think, you know, it's really important for you to get if you're new. And that's that this is uh, about something called a self obsessed ego. And uh, it's not that you, you know, you're thinking good about yourself, but you're thinking about yourself all the time. Like right now, you're thinking, is he thinking about me thinking about me? Guys, what is he, you know what I'm saying? 
I sent an e a text to a, a fellow alcoholic in California a while back, and I said, I was just thinking about me, and I was wondering if you were thinking about me, too. <laughs> And she texts back and said, I'm sorry, what did you say? I was thinking about me. <laughs> you, you don't get to Alcoholics Anonymous because it's something that you aspire to do. Uh, you know, I'm going to do university, have a couple of kids, join AA. Um, I don't think it was ever put better than it was put by a guy named Henry uh, Tebow. He, uh, in 1939, got a copy of the original manuscript, Alcoholics Anonymous, and he just had a, an awakening about how he'd been trying to treat this disorder, and he realized that we, we were getting a lot of things right, and he became a student of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he said that what it requires is reaching a feeling of personal helplessness. See, here's an interesting thing about Alcoholics Anonymous. is that, I mean, we get here... We've reached a feeling of per personal helplessness because prior to that, you can't get us here. I don't care how bad you've been humiliated. <laughs> I've drank with people, you know, your leg's off, that's okay. You know, <laughs> you know, if you lost your car, you've lost your house, you've lost everything, and then you go out, you have four martinis, you say, i, I got to quit. But people say, like, what happened? You reached a feeling of personal helplessness. And one of the things that I hear in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you know, if you say this and you want to continue to say this, just accept you're wrong. Um, <laughs> it's just a little joke. Um, but you're not wrong. This is just my opinion. And everything I say here, by the way, I'm no great guru. I mean, they didn't get me here and pay me to talk to you, by the way. Um, they're a, I, they almost killed me trying to get me not to talk to you, but... <laughs> Here's the thing about it is, you know, you'll hear, it, you know, if you're new that, that uh, you know, whoever got, got up earliest this morning uh, has the longest sobriety. And I'll tell you why I have some trouble with that is because of my own journey in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, in my first three years of Alcoholics Anonymous, I went from not knowing to bulletproof. I mean, I became an instant old timer and I knew everything there was to know about everything there was to know. And, uh, and what happened was, as I continued to stay sober, I hit what Henry Thibault called a bottom, which is this feeling of personal helplessness, and I continued to hit feelings of personal helplessness in the journey. And as I stayed sober a longer period of time, I had to have more and more and more surrenders, which makes old-timers very valuable to you if you're here and you're new because... They have gone through a bunch of stuff and done a bunch of surrender, and that's what this dealio is all about, is surrender. And you can't do acceptance until you do surrender. So that's what I talk about a little bit tonight, and I really love what Lyle said. This is not about what it was like. It was like what it was like because what you were like. Believe me, I caused a whole bunch of it uh, around me. In fact, uh, one guy told me, he said, you know that it, it, gets, it gets better? I said, yeah. He said, well, the it is you. So I want to talk a little bit about what I was like, what happened, and what I am like now, to the best of my honest ability at this point, having surrendered as much as I've been able to do. So um, I, I was 11 years old. You, you might say, well, what would, you, what would you suggest might be an indicator of your alcoholism at 11 years old? And I, I, my first pointer was that I had two paper routes, and I was in debt to some of the worst people in the school. <laughs> I'm telling you, that, that's what's called in the second part of step one, unmanageability. <laughs> the second thing was that I had a terrible sense of just general hatred toward anything that breathed in and out. My mother used to drive me insane, sitting there breathing in and out and in and out. I, I already had a disease of perception. I mean, if you loved me, I thought you were stupid. I couldn't... You see, what the, you know, you say to me at 11 years old, what do you think that an 11-year-old has lost that could qualify him or her to be alcoholic? And I'll tell you exactly what I had lost at 11 years old and why I thought every single day of my 11th year about jumping off the house onto the patio and killing myself 
which was dead serious stuff to me at 11 years old, probably the most popular kid in school, an excellent student, just no hope. I had reached a level of personal hopelessness. And I would love to tell you that a AA van drove up, bring out that kid. <laughs> and I've been good ever since. It's not what happened. I found a false god in a bathroom in Melville, Saskatchewan. I don't know if you've ever been to Saskatchewan in Canada. It's so flat that on a clear day, standing on a pineapple can, you can see the back of your own head. <laughs> That's not that funny. What's wrong with you? <laughs> There's, I mean, there's all kinds of stories in Saskatchewan about people watching their dogs run away for three or four days, and you know. <laughs> but you know, um, at 11 years old, in a bathroom with a kid that I grew up with, a kid named Guy, my closest friend, we discovered a little number, a little lifesaver, a little thing that. Saved me from suiciding. Strange to say, but true. It was all that was between me and me doing myself, and that was Loganberry wine. That stuff's incredible when you're 11 years old. It has a magic quality. It goes down purple, comes up pink. <laughs> and um, it tastes like crap, but I'm telling you, that I, I took the first drink and went, oh, God, I'll have another one. You know, <laughs> right there, they should have had the AA van bring them out because normal people go, oh God, and they don't have any more. Normal people. What is that anyway? Exactly. You heard the Elanon talk today. What the hell is a normal person? <laughs> okay. Well, um, one of my favorite Elanon speakers said one time if you take the alcohol out of an alcoholic, you get a neurotic that eventually turns into an Elanon, but <laughs> that's, a, yeah, it's outside opinion. <laughs> I never said that. Um, that, uh, that Loganberry wine did, uh, did for me, it, 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 it solved the first time in my young life my feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. I did not feel hopeless and helpless any longer. In fact, I felt empowered. I felt like I should go beat the snot out of my older brother, Michael, who had been provoking me nonstop from the time I was a child. And I thought I'd just go and give him the licking of his life. And, uh, you know, physics was against me. I was 11, he was 16. Um, I thought, like, one heavy crotch shot, and then uh, I'm on him. And uh, I was already moving faster than anything I'd ever seen. I got on my bike, rode into the back of a truck, did a skin donation, and then... <laughs> sat there with that satisfied grin of the new alcoholic thinking that did not even hurt. <laughs> you know, my brother Michael, many years later, many years later, I mean, as the result of my step nine, actually, I phoned Michael and made an amend, and he said, let me get this straight. The people in Alcoholics Anonymous told you that it wasn't my fault, that you're a complete screw-up. I said, that's right, Michael, and I want to apologize for blaming you all these years. He said, where are these people? <laughs> Man, if they can help you, I want to see them. I want to see all of them, you know. Maybe maybe 10 or 12 or 16 years, I don't know how many years later, Michael knocked on my door. I'd been sober, I think, 12 years at that point. Michael knocked on my door, and he had everything that he had in the whole world in a Safeway shopping bag. And he said, Marty, you're the only person I trust. Uh, will, you, will you sponsor me? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'll sponsor you. <laughs> now, if you're new in the room tonight and you haven't laughed for a while, I can tell you it's going to hurt. It's because uh, you haven't laughed right from your gut for a while. You you learn how to laugh in French when you're drinking. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that! Bob fell off his chair. <laughs> And that's the sound that came out of me when Mike said, will you sponsor me? <laughs> uh, 
Here's what I found out about talking in Alcoholics Anonymous. When, I, when I'm laughing, my ego drops. When my ego drops, somebody can tell me something I can hear for a short period of time. So I do lots of humor. But I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing funny about this disease. That brother Michael, who's now sober, I think something like 20 or 25 years Oh, God, a year and a half ago or so, he phoned. He said, Marty, you're never going to believe it. Aaron, I went into Aaron's bedroom this morning. He's dead. That's my nephew. Just laid down on his face, young alcoholic, and he just passed. The blood just was too thin in his heart, and he just got away, 36 years old. I wish that was the only one. You know, if you think you've got another bout in you tonight, I'm just begging you on behalf of my nephew. Don't do that. Or I could tell you about the young man that I was bringing to the conference tonight, a young man I sponsor, who, uh, for you know, I've never done this before in my entire AA experience. I bought a ticket for him on my credit card and bought insurance. I've never done that. And, uh, and then what happened was um, he phoned me on Sunday afternoon and said his wife uh, had overdosed and was dead. And uh, now they have a two-year-old child for him to try and figure out how to do, you know, you know what I'm saying? This is a this is no screwing around. It's funny looking back at this stuff. You know why? Because we're not doing it anymore. It's like when they were, you know, at an AA meeting, somebody talks about peeing their pants. Everybody's in hysterics, unless you're not done peeing your pants, and then you're saying so. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is the matter with you people? You know. And then some idiot's family has returned to him. They're all, <laughs> you know, my big hope was my family would never come back, you know. So it was all upside down and backwards. It's a paradoxical program. And so uh, I went home to beat Michael up, and, and uh, you know, I had the knee out of my pants. I puked all over myself, and I was really beat up. And this is where I came to understand that there is only one consciousness in the world, one thought for alcoholic brains. And the reason I know that is, is that we all say the same thing. So when my mother, who was shocked to see her 11-year-old child like that, she said, have you been drinking? I said, I had two. <laughs> same thing I told the cops the night I got busted. You know, I had two. It was always two. Where do we get that stuff? My, my poor mother, you know, I, she was very English. And when I joined Alcoholics Anonymous, she said, what will you do next to humiliate this family? You know, she became a huge fan of Alcoholics Anonymous by the time she died. Uh, I just got to tell you that uh, she opened the door that night and looked at that thing standing there and said, "What in the hell?" Because I'm not from that home. I'm not. I'm. I'm from. My father was a raging Irish, uh, heavy drinker. And let me, and you're, you're new, so I'm going to tell you something. If you're one of us, when you start to drink, it you can't. You get thirsty. It's the goofiest thing. And apparently, the people of Earth don't have this. They drink, they get full. <laughs> How would that work? I can't even drink Coke and get full. You know? Yeah. I'd suck the chrome off the, a truck parked across the street to get a beer out of it. I mean, I just, I, I get, the more I drink, the more I need to drink. Heavy drinkers aren't like that. My old man, if you got drunk, he'd got drunk. If you didn't get drunk, he could social drink with you. I, and he used to say to me, can't you drink normally? And I would think, well, you know what? I must be weak. I must be, there's something wrong with me. I just feel so bad. Why can't I be a man like my old man? But I'll tell you what he did. He controlled the entire world through his anger. And he would just take that house apart. I mean, he ripped the cupboards right off the wall. And I remember one of my early remembrances in that 11th year was hiding under the bed, terrified and feeling such a coward for not going down and protecting my mother. That hung with me for many, many years. And so, I mean, our house was a house full of, of pictures. They, like, they, they sent you to church. They didn't go to church. You know, I remember when I got kicked out of church at about 11 years old for selling condoms. And uh, What is that so wrong? And uh, I... Um, anyway, uh, and I was told that I was a dirty, filthy little boy uh, and, and was a wicked little guy. And, and, I mean, we were just filling them with water and throwing them at cars. I didn't know there were for anything. I swear to God. <laughs> but I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and you start talking to me about a god of my own concept. And I'm thinking, you mean the condom god, the one that kicked me right out of the house? Like, my grandfather was the founder of that church. Do you know how humiliating that was for our family? Yeah, I believe in him all right. But he doesn't believe in me. And so we have a problem here. 
He'll help everyone. He's just going to dangle me until he cooks me. That's how this thing works. Are you people stupid or something? And so when I, when I went into the house that night and there was all the pandemonium of that house and my father, of course, had the self-righteous you know, attack and banged me all over the house and I was all bruised up and my brother got home and I kind of, hey, 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 a couple of swings, you know, nothing much. And then out cold, you know, after I had the foot on the floor so the bed quit spinning because that projectile bombing gets your hair wet. I don't care who you are when you start. <laughs> So six months or so ago, I was going through customs, and the customs officer said, what do you want in the United States of America? They can get really formal sometimes, actually. And then, you know, the little bugger in me wants to start playing with it. So I said, I, I'm going down to speak to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, what special skills do you have to speak at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? I said, well... Toward the end of my drinking, I could puke in the air over my own head and not get my hair wet. And, uh, was, he said, "He said, just, just go." I'm just, I'm just, I could pee my pants and blame it on somebody else. Go, go, you're in. Imagine how excited I was, having hit a bottom sober in the first 11 years of my life, to go to my grade 6 comrades and tell them that I had found the most incredible thing. You've got to understand, I've got bruises on my head. I still smell like puke. My hair's out like this. I'm telling them, guys, <laughs> I smashed my bike up. My dad beat me up. I puked. I passed out. you got to try this stuff. <laughs> And that was the first time I had the people with the little skinny eyes and the blue lips that, that Clancy talked to. What are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? And last summer, I went to a 40th high school reunion, and there was my love, Gail Walters. And she and a number of girls came up and said, you know, I loved you in school. I, I looked better. So let it go. But anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's because you're sober doesn't mean you take care of yourself, sweetheart. So I'm telling you. This is a face that has worn out three other bodies. But <laughs> where did I tell you the rest of the story? <laughs> I have a four year old son. Ooh. Some places I tell that, and the guys always go, dude. <laughs> And the women go, wow, oh. Yeah, so anyway. Oh. That's where I, 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 I recant that. I didn't know the gun was loaded. I know. when you're an alcoholic and you found a solution because you, this terrible feeling of helplessness is pervasive. It, and the problem in, in, in sobriety is that everything seems personal. Everything seems pervasive, like it's going to go through your entire life. Look at that. He stuck his tongue out of me. Now everybody hates me. <laughs> That's how I think. You know what? And it's not personal, pervasive, pervasive or permanent. But when, see, at 11 years old, that terrible feeling of helplessness overwhelmed me so completely that this was my ticket. And so by grade 7, I was chronically alcoholic. I drank from the beginning. Now you might say, wow, I mean, didn't your parents? No, my parents did not get it. I even learned how to play rock and roll lead guitar so I could hang out with the other kids that were, you know, in the bands out in the weekends, and we just get hammered every single weekend, just hammered, and then hammered during the week wherever we possibly could. By the time I was 13, I was a mess. And, you know, nobody in the really world would ever look at an 11-year-old and say, hey, chronic alcoholic, would you? Because we mix it up to do with the drinking. The drinking is the relief mechanism. Are you getting that, newcomers? We don't drink because we're alcoholic. Or do we? See, you put it backwards, then they start arguing with you the other way. Yes, I do. 
I drink because I'm alcoholic. That's correct. <laughs> Boy, this is screwed up, eh? Anyway. That's exactly, see, what happened in the bathroom at 11 years old when I drank the Loganberry wine was that my alcoholism was revealed to me. I was already dying an alcoholic death. You know how that goes? It starts with loneliness. It starts with loneliness because your spiritual side can only be filled by God. So I start to get lonely. Then it moves into my emotions. And my emotions become apathetic. I remember in grade two, I used to get the strap every single day in school. I know that surprises some of you. But I mean, brutality in schools in those days was commonplace. I get the strap every single day. And at Christmas, I was reading some books with little friends. And we found out about voodoo. And I put a curse on the grade two teacher. And she died. <laughs> I'm still wrestling to have remorse over that. I, I just I hated that one. <laughs> And so, and Dick's here and heard that, and now I'm going to get it. But anyway, <laughs> I'm 11 years old. I killed my grade two teacher. I got a bad attitude, a bad attitude all through high school. By the time I'm in university, I'm drunk every single class. I, I remember a, a professor of economics calling me in, and he said, you know, I really would like it if you would not come back after Christmas. I said, excuse me? I'm doing really well in your class. He said, you snore, and you're drunk all the time. I said, you know what? I'm going to get my crap together, and I'm going to come back after Christmas and be different. He said, if you ever got your crap together, you wouldn't be able to pick it up. It'd be so heavy. <laughs> so, this is how this goes. I had that terrible feeling of helplessness when I went onto the university campus, and there's all those people moving around. Don't they all look like they know what, where they're going, what they're doing, and they've got a plan? Four more years and I'll be a space cadet, you know, like. <laughs> I'm thinking, where's the bar? Like, where's the university pub so I can get down there and get hammered and so I can start telling you who I am? Because it, it just, you know, for a long period of time, alcohol did for me the things I could not do for myself. It gave me a new freedom and a new joy. You know, it, it really was the center, the eco-center of my life. It was, the, it was that thing that kept me alive long enough for you to grab me and get a hold of me and say, hey, come here, selfish, wake up. Because I was dead asleep, dead asleep, terrified every single day at the end of my drinking thinking about dying. That's all I wanted to do it was just one good act before I died. Just one good thing. You know, alcoholism is so monotonous. People that say, oh, AA meetings are so boring. I always tell them, you can't remember the end of your drinking. It's boring. You know, it's like that uh, ride at Disneyland. That uh, It's a small world. Have you ever been on that? Oh, baby. You know, you see it and you think, hey, this is great. It's a small world. I'm going to get on this. And then they go, it's a small world after all. Wow. It's a small world after all. Holy crap, that's the same doll again. We've been in here an hour. It's a small world after. Oh, I want out of here. It doesn't matter. It's a small world after all. You know, cut your wrist, cut your throat, but you're still in the boat. It's a small world after all. That's what it is. Alcoholism just goes on and on, and at the end of it, you know, you're trying to do people a favor by killing you. <laughs> See, because Chuck said it better than anybody said it. He said that what we suffer from is a, a problem that is the mother of all of our problems, and that is a self-obsessed ego. An ego that is so terrified it spends all of its time trying to protect me and in that blocks me from you and blocks me from God and nothing can get through because I'm so scared to breathe in and breathe out. And the only time that I have any sense of normalcy is when I'm drinking. And you know, I wish <laughs> with all my heart I would have had one drunk that measured up to the planning of how the drunk was going to go when I was going on it. I'm telling you. You know those fantasies? <laughs> it's Friday. Not that you weren't drunk Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, and Monday. Oh, it's Friday, and now I can have divine release. I'm just going to have a few. You know, get a buzz on, get a guitar, get her. <laughs> a 
all of a sudden you see your own ass going through a bank window. How did this happen? <laughs> I got a lot of surprises. I was not, when I blacked out, I could never stay blacked out. And God always woke me up for the most embarrassing part of whatever I was doing. <laughs> When you're reaching these feelings of absolute personal helplessness on a daily and hourly basis, living becomes so... De- this is nothing to sneeze at, okay? This is the serious <laughs> part of this. It's every time I head into and I'm really going to lay on the truth, then... <laughs> probably from a center somewhere or something. I'm just, um, This is why if you're an Alcoholics Anonymous and you get a head full of AA and a belly full of whiskey, it's a scary, horrible place to be. Because for just as long as you stay with us, you start to get a sense of hope. And then you go back out there and you get the synthetic hope again, and just for a moment or two it looks like that's going to be okay, and then that's not okay. And then you come here and you go there, and you come here and you go there, and I'm telling you. It's just, you know, I I think God recognized me to be too absolutely weak and stupid to have a relapse. And I want to tell you, if you're a new person in the room tonight and you haven't had a relapse, it's not mandatory. You don't have to go in and out 95 freaking times. You know what? (laughs) Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship. I mean, here's the thing about it. You know, my entire life, because I had this terrible feeling of hopelessness and helplessness, that I spent my entire time trying to hide me from you so you wouldn't figure me out. You wouldn't get behind the veil to find out that I was this great, big, vacuous, sucking crybaby. And so I just, I distanced myself from you. And if you got close to me, I would get you settled pretty damn quick. And that came into sobriety with me. I remember a two-year sober, a really nice member of Alcoholics Anonymous said, Hey! Saw you in Safeway last Wednesday, and you didn't even say hi. I said I wasn't in Safeway on Wednesday. I was in Safeway on Wednesday. I just didn't want him to know where I was. <laughs> I, you, you can be sneaky until you're dead in here. You know, you keep, your, you keep your dirty little secrets to yourself, and they will kill you. You know, like, I, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous not because I wanted to. My sister phoned Alcoholics Anonymous. And they sent over Shrek, and he drives up into like a 1976 Ford LTD. This thing was not a car. It was like a, a, an ocean liner. It was it Robin's Egg Blue, had those vinyl seats. Remember those things? Oh, it was, <laughs> and I'm cool. I'm a radio pronouncer. In 1978, I mean, I'm, I've got my face on the side of a bus. I know that because laying in front of the Queen's Hotel in my own vomit, I saw a bus go by. <laughs> Here's the arrogance of the drunken alcoholic. I'm thinking, that's a waste of a billboard to put it down here that's part of town like this. (laughs) I'm laying in my own puke, judging the marketing department at CFQC Radio. Hello. I heard a guy say one time, we're narcissists, which means that you're having a love affair with yourself and can't stand the object of your affection. Dwayne drives up in this car, and he, uh, I couldn't believe it. He was like, he got out of the car, and out of the car, and out of the car. This guy is huge. And he says, I hear you drink even when you're not thirsty. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) Oh, man. A rehab comedian. Oh, good. And then he told me he loved my radio show, and, and you know, that's just what you need to hear because your ego is not big enough, right? And then he took me on our first date to the A&W. I, I don't know about you. Did you drink a lot of coffee when you were drinking? I'd never seen men get together and have coffee before. It seemed bizarre to me. We're going to do what? We're going to go to the A&W and sit in the car and talk. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you, did it, does that seem stupid to you or what? And, and then, and then, and then, and then... He's not talking about me. He's talking about him. What the hell's going on here? This is my thing. What are you? And he's telling me he got drunk and he split a train and a half so he could make it in time to a liquor board store. And I'm thinking, well, I did worse than that. See, in Alcoholics Anonymous, if you're new, you'll find out that if you said you made love to a zebra at a meeting, 
somebody would say, well, at least the one you had was female. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it doesn't... It's... <laughs> if you have an alternate lifestyle, I want you to understand my middle son I, is gay, so I, I am, I'm not going anywhere with any of that. Just, just in fun. But... Um, The more he talked about him, the more I knew I could outdo his little stories. And so, you know when it's your time to talk, it's when the other person takes a breath, right? <laughs> so he did that, and I went in, I started telling him. I did this and I did that, and by the end of it, he, he said, holy crap. <laughs> well, I can't say you're alcoholic, but it sounds like you get in trouble a lot of the time when you drink. And, uh, and you don't get in trouble when you don't drink. I thought, oh, why did I tell him all that stuff? Immediately, immediately. What were you thinking, you stupid, egotistical ass? That's the first thing. And now he knows where you live. <laughs> Should I? But that wasn't bad enough. He was soon introducing me to his AA friends, like Dennis the murderer, who now knows where I live, right? <laughs> Dennis had beat his friend to death with his fists, but he hasn't had a drink for over three years. Oh, hey, that's nice. Are, are, you, are you pissed off at all right now, Dennis? Because I, I have a sudden feeling of personal helplessness and hopelessness, you know? And if I could have a drink, I'd kick your ass. Okay, that's how it works. Well, it isn't how it works. <laughs> and he says, I'm going to pick you up for a meeting in the morning. I said, what kind of a meeting? He said, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, oh, I, you know, uh... <laughs> he said, I'll pick you up at 9 o'clock. So I left the house at 8. <laughs> and he was in the car waiting for me. <laughs> and, uh, no, it's true. He said every once in a while a sick newcomer will try and escape. And uh, I said, well, I, that was not, I thought you said eight. He said, that doesn't matter. Get in the car. That's the first step in Alcoholics Anonymous when you got a real sponsor. Get in the car. No, I'm really interested in what you think. So why don't you try this? No, shut up. Get in the car. Dwayne one time told me, if you don't have more fun sober than you had drunk, you're going to get drunk. And so in my early sobriety, we learned how to have fun. Like we'd pick up newcomers in his van that only had two seats. And, and we'd go up and down the ditches and we'd roll them around in the back until somebody admitted that they had a God more powerful than themselves. <coughs> Which is hysterically funny unless you're one of the guys in the back of the van. I get to the meeting, you heard it described here earlier, full of really old people. The guy at the front looked like he'd been sent to be wrinkled. He was really old. <laughs> Jesus, what's he? I'll bet he was 50. No. No, I know what you're thinking. I'm exaggerating, but no. He really, I mean, he really looked awful. And then the rest of them all, I'm pretty sure, had a colostomy or something under the table because they were drinking more coffee than humanly possible. <laughs> And then they talked about some guy named Bob, and I figured, nay, Bob, nay, Bob, all right, it's a coffee company that's got some sort of a network marketing scheme going or something here. <laughs> they're going up and down some damn stairs or something, and I have no understanding what they're doing. One guy's stuck on the fifth stair, and there's an old guy there, <laughs> who I figured had passed away at least Thursday last week. <laughs> and he's telling the guy who's stuck on the fifth stair that if you don't get off that fifth step, you're going to get drunk. And I'm thinking, why don't we start right at the fifth step? And then we can all get drunk, because that's what I want to do. <laughs> if you've got somebody telling you that you, you, you have to find people that want this thing, <laughs> look around them. You'll see dead people all around them. Who comes here wanting this thing? I came here because I had a complete feeling of helplessness. And I found an answer here after a period of time. Once I got my ego down far enough after you had deflated me at great depth, which you did very well. 
I remember at the end of that meeting, this guy at the front said the most incredible thing I had ever heard come out of a human being's mouth to that point. He said, if you want what we have, what? <laughs> I'm looking around at night of the walking dead. <laughs> I'm thinking, what the hell do you have? They seem to be happy, but I mean, I, so I got out in the parking lot, and I'm a newcomer. I don't know if you know this about newcomers or not. We lie. <laughs> so when Dwayne said, how did you like the meeting? I said, I loved that meeting. He said, yeah, I thought so. So I said, listen, if you want to come on my radio show and do a, like a money drive or, uh, you know, if I can help you. He said, oh, shut up. <laughs> what? I never had anybody talk to me like this before. Did you find that in AA? Dick, when I was 30 years sober, called me a self-directed goof. <laughs> a term of endearment. I was a self-directed goof. When, I, when somebody I respect that much tells me that, today, because I, I don't have as much a sense of hopelessness and helplessness, I say, if a man of that caliber tells you something like that, Marty, you're not seeing clearly anymore. You know, you're not seeing clearly anymore, and so I can go about and do something. <coughs> anyway, Dwayne said, listen, I'm going to pick you up for another meeting. I said, I don't want to go to any more meetings. He said, that does not even matter. <laughs> I said, what do you mean it doesn't matter? I have rights. He said, you have no rights. You're an alcoholic. I said, you told me last night you couldn't tell me I was an alcoholic. He said, that was before you went to a meeting. <laughs> yeah. He said, normal people don't go to meetings of alcoholics and all. <laughs> Feeling somewhat tricked, I said, I'm going to, you can't make me go to meetings. He said, oh, yeah, I can make you go to meetings. I, I said, I'll call the police. He said, they're in on it. I knew that about them. I knew that if there was something like that, they'd be in on it. Because I'm an alcoholic. I hate authority. I hate anybody that can take anything away from me, especially if I don't want it. <laughs> I, oh, man. That lady took me to a meeting. We went to the mustard seeds. And this was a little encouraging because there was two or three girls at the meeting. So when they said, they have this, like, let's humiliate the newcomer at the end of the meeting in Canada. So they say, does the newcomer want to say anything? <laughs> I'm just bottled up, man. I've been kicked out of Kinsman. I've been kicked out of JCs. I've been kicked out of university. I know how to get kicked out of places. So I say, you girls, were you hookers? <laughs> This is where I learned not to mess with the alcoholic women. Um, uh, yeah, Ruth looked at me and she said I was never a hooker, but sometimes I'd get really drunk and I'd pick up an anemic looking little turd like you and take them home. <laughs> you remember that moment when you're having difficulty liking a group of people? We, we got outside. I said, I am not going to any more meetings. And he said, I can't. I go, oh, yes, you are, because they loved you. <laughs> Man, they're going to be waiting for you to come back. i got to take you back. I said, I don't want to go around those people. There's something wrong with those people. Oh, yeah. He said, there is, and you are just like them. <laughs> oh, man. It's a fellowship. Let me tell you about sponsorship because, you know, so many people get hung up. I've, I've told this story, I don't know how many times, and, I, and every once in a while somebody will come out and say, I, I wish I'd had a sponsor like that. And I always want to say to them, why don't you become a sponsor like that? Quit sucking your thumb and go become a sponsor like that. You know, at Dwayne's 44th AA anniversary, they flew me in to speak. And I went on and on about the things this man had done for me and how he practically lived at our house in my first nine months of sobriety. And when he got up, he said, what a pile of crap. 
He said, I didn't care about him. I was fighting with Audrey. I just didn't want to go home. <laughs> That's why I now have Dick for a sponsor. Look. Listen, sponsorship is that it's a safe harbor. If you've got a sponsor that's telling everybody everything that you're telling them to build themselves up, you've got the wrong sponsor. You've got to be able to phone that person, lay your guts on the table, and never hear about it anywhere else ever again. Because if you don't have that, you're never going to build that trust. I'm going to tell you a little thing about me. My, one of my greatest problems with God was that my father was a raging lunatic. I could not conceive of a father in any other way. And so when I got Shrek to begin, and then I got Terry, and now a guy like Dick, it's so easy for me to understand that my father loves me. I don't get abusive conversation or anything like that from those guys, but I get the truth. Very often, something I don't want to do, I've had Dick tell me things that I was absolutely dead against doing. Let me tell you one of them. We're in New Orleans. Dick's got his blue blazer on and that cross-arm attitude thing. <laughs> And, and when Dick loses it, he goes like this. <laughs> Look out, baby. He's going off. <laughs> all, and all of my fellow misfits know exactly what I'm talking about there. <laughs> Stand back. And he says, when are you going to apologize to your sister? I said, excuse me? You mean the sister that ripped me off for 168 grand? And then when I was out of town, went and got another 20 out of my account? That sister? He said, yeah. I said, Dick, am I missing something here? He said, yeah, you owe her an apology. I said, what? how could I owe her an apology? Well, he said, when you gave her all that money to save her business, did you know that she couldn't handle the money? Did you know that she was inept? Were you just throwing money at her big shot? <laughs> God damn dick. <laughs> That's what my ego does immediately when I get that sense of helplessness to start. Up come the blaming radar. Oh, Dick's fault. Dick shouldn't be saying that to me. How dare he? Does he know who I used to be? <laughs> Oh, man, I go home. It's the day before Christmas. I can't get this out of my mind. So I phone my sister, and I say, Lori, it's Marty. This is the woman that phoned Alcoholics Anonymous and saved my life. I have not talked to her for seven years sober. And I was at podiums all over the place. So if you think these are well people talking to you, no. We're sharing our experience with you, okay? <laughs> Some of the sickest people in AA are at podiums. Believe me. You're looking at what? Did I just say that out loud? I phone her and I say, Lori, it's Marty. Dead silence. I say, uh, Lori, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, as you know. I have a sponsor named Dick Martin. And Dick wanted me to call you uh, as part of my program. Oh, never mind, Lori. I, I want to apologize to you. I just, that money thing was just, it was wrong. And I, and I, and there, 45 minutes she talked. I realized after she finished, I missed a whole bunch of my inventory. She just reamed me. For, like My wife kept walking by and going, what's going on? What's going on? I'm getting whiter and whiter. She's back. You know, when I was a kid, what I did, and she just ripped me a new one, right? But I'm thinking, who will I tell Dick this? <laughs> and then at the end of it, she starts to cry, and she starts to say, oh, God, Marty, you're one of the most significant men in my entire life. I've missed you so much. I'm I just, you know... That was Christmas Day. The day after Christmas, my mother died. So you say to yourself, what would the family have done with her and I at war and the entire family polarized on one side or the other of that dispute and my poor mom laying there dead and we can't come together as a family? See, that's sponsorship. I'm sure Dick didn't look forward to that moment of telling me what an idiot I was. I mean, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. But... Uh, <laughs> I don't have I don't have a month go by that I don't think thank God for Dick thank God that he's in my life because my family now is reunited my sister has become the matriarch of the family taken her rightful place she's ten years older than I and uh, and she's she's incredibly wonderful and she phones me almost every single day and and my brother Michael 
is not, not getting over the death of his son at all. He's just he's just not doing good at all. So she took him into her home. He's living in her basement, reading books and smoking four packages of cigarettes a day. <laughs> I hope you don't think that's addictive. Um, <laughs> and he could use your prayers. He really could. Alcoholics Anonymous is that place where you you know you go to a group, a G R O U P, grow up, and uh, Alcoholics is the Anonymous is that place where you start to own your part of it. And so let me tell you a little bit about today. I told you I have a four and a half year old child. His name is Luca, and Luca is you know at this age, and my wife had postpartum depression, so the first three years of Luca's life, I was the primary caregiver. Which hard on the nipples. I just got to, you know, it's <laughs> not breastfeeding. I just, I can't help it. Okay, I, I can't help it. I want your approval. I do stupid little jokes, and then I'm sorry. But <laughs> three and a half years, podiums all over the world. Marty J's up there saying, "Oh, I wish I'd have been a better father. I know I could have been a great father." I know that if I had a child now, I'd be so different. God said, hey, no problem, dude. <laughs> you can have one. Lucas says to me the other day, Papa, how big is God? I said, oh, he's big. Could you get him in the car? <laughs> no, it's Luca, he's huge. Would he go in my preschool? I said, he's huge, he's huge, he's as big as everything is. He said, well, what good is he then? <laughs> so I was able to tell him that God is deep down inside of every man, woman, and child. That God is, is you are an expression, Luca, of God. You're what God looks like as Luca. And he just, he just loved that. And he, you, know, you, know, you see a picture of him, he's just an absolute, he's an angel. He's just the most beautiful child. So I, I've got this incredible bond. Now, I have three adult children. I have a, a son, Donovan, who's 36 years old. He's six months sober longer than I am. He was he was six months old when I went to the ANA, and when he was nine years old, he said, how do I get into AA? And I said, why would you want to go into AA? He says, because I don't want to drink. I don't want anything to do with that. I said, well, just don't drink. He's never had a drink of alcohol. He, he, had, he said his 36th birthday, July the 20th. And my middle son, Chad, is a marketing executive in, in, in Montreal, and, uh, you know, he that has been a really interesting journey. He's one of my closest friends today. And I have a daughter named Bees Labat, I mean Lee. Um, I don't think I'm making any friends here tonight, Jim. <laughs> Dick is taking notes. I'm going to get it, man. I'm going to get it. But at 16 years old, she came home with a bottle of vodka, apparently, and drank the whole thing. It was out cold on the floor with a pack of smokes on the floor. Our house didn't have any cigarettes or any liquor in it her entire life. It was a parade of alcoholics coming through the house. A celebration of this thing called recovery. And somehow she just had to give it a run, right? She just got, I mean, just shitty face drunk. Out cold. And, and then when she came to, she was different. She had an attitude. And she, she started to hang out with kind of like lower companions almost immediately. I said, you know, I've seen this movie. I know how this goes. And so I packed her and her 1,700-pound trachaner horse um, up, and I sent her to a private girl's school. And she was so grateful. She gained uh, 55 pounds, shaved her hair flat, came down at Christmas down the escalator like this. <laughs> My Elanon wife was talking through her teeth, which is never good. <laughs> Don't react. Don't react. What happened was nothing short of a miracle after that year of school. She came back to where uh, she asked us, you know, if she could move back home and finish her 12th, 12th grade. And, and uh, I very nervously acquiesced, and, and we bought a new home and went into a new community where we had these, a very special kind of school. And, and uh, it was hell. It was hell. She was in tears every two minutes. She was mad at me every minute in between. And uh, one night at the supper table, she looked at me and she said, Will you take me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? And if you're a parent in the room tonight, 
you know that the first thing that crosses your mind is, how do I not screw this up? Because if I look too excited, she's going to say, well, never mind. And if I don't look excited, then she's going to be offended. So I said, yeah, we can do that if you want. And, uh, <laughs> I take her to this meeting. This is a, like, Alberta is like Texas. Very, very similar. There's a town there called Calgary, which is just like Dallas. And then there's another town called Edmonton, which is just like Houston. And it's an oil place. And in between is this town called Red Deer, which is where we live. And, and there's this lake called Sylvan Lake, and it's all guys that drive trucks. And it's the only meeting that's on that night. So I take my daughter, Lee, into the Sylvan Lake meeting. And I can't believe it. It seems like every young person in Alcoholics Anonymous had suddenly shown up at the Sylvan Lake meeting. There were all kinds of them. And they'd say, uh, dude, I like, I'd like to like, share. So... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I was kind of like, and uh, and then it was like, oh, so I said, ooh, and then, I don't know, like, anyway, that's all I got, and uh, I'm looking at her and going, and she says, wow, I, she heard the music, she heard the music. She, and she, you know, she, she doesn't go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I get asked that all the time, but she's, she's not drink, hasn't drank her, but it's been years and years. She has two children, uh, two grand, I have two grandchildren. So Luca, uh, when I delivered, I delivered him, came out of his mother. He was a brother-in-law and an uncle, which is <laughs> creepy. I don't care who you are. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I've had a job for five years. I've been living out of my checking account. That's getting a little skinny. And so we started a corporation. I'm way out of practice. I've done a whole bunch of stupid things. I got my partners just angry and hell at me. And uh, up until this weekend, I was just thinking what a couple of idiots they were. <clears throat> and halfway through the session yesterday, I was thinking, I don't want to admit I'm wrong. That's what this does for me. You don't have to tell me that. I just sit here and I listen to the music and all of a sudden God gives me answers. And I, you know, for the last number of months I've had just two word prayer and it's just working so well I've got to share it with you because my brother Michael on the death day of Aaron, I phoned Michael. He said, Michael, I just wanted to tell you how sorry I am again about Aaron. And, and you know, uh, you were a wonderful dad. I mean, at the end of his life, Mike, you were, you were just like there. And he said, yeah. I know. And I said, you know, some things seem so unfair. I, I can't wait, you know, to get on the other side and get up to God and get some answer, get him to answer some questions. Like, did the did the polls drive the voting or the voting voting drive the polls? I want to know that, you know? And he said, I don't have any questions for God. I thought, oh, oh. I said, what do you mean, Mike? He said, he knows everything. I don't need to question him to check to see if I'm right. I just need to get him to show me what he's got. That's all. And that changed my whole spiritual life. That's all I say to God every day now is just show me. Just show me how to do it. I mean, I didn't come here and say, you know, let me listen to Bob Darrell and figure out that I'm acting like a, 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 a child in my own corporation. Uh, uh, no, God just showed me while I talked was going on. And if you, if you can't pray, it's just simple. You get down on your knees and you say, Father, show me. See, what that takes away for me as an alcoholic is, is that God... Thy will be done, and now here is thy will. I want this person well, and that person saved, and this person not drunk, and I want, you know, and, and, and that might not line up at all with God's will. Show me as, as it goes on, God, help me no matter what's going on. In the middle of, let's say, just, I'm going to just fly way out here, in the middle of the worst hailstorm in all of Omaha history. <laughs> Let me stay calm. We, we were pretty good in that thing, right? I just knew that if God wanted me to be okay, nothing was going to change it. And if there was something else that needed to be done, he was going to be right at my side. I mean, that's a different place for a guy who has terrible feelings of insecurity. This is the one of the, if not the premier conference in all of the United States of America. I, I'm saddened that my... Sponsor and friend Dick is not talking tomorrow morning, although Maren, who's a phenomenal speaker, I hope you'll really enjoy her tomorrow. I'll be here. But it's the end of a 
uh, a time Dick, Dick, I said to Dick, why aren't you doing it? He said, just comes a time. It's enough. <laughs> Thank, thanks for sharing, Dick. Uh, <laughs> don't push. <laughs> You want to get in the car with no stupid? Come on, lay off, back off. <laughs> I don't always get what I want, but I get what I need. And when I get what I need, it's exactly what I wanted all along. God bless you. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.